Greetings from Courtney, Nebraska. <clears throat> Little distortion in my right hearing aid. I don't know how the Bluetooth works, honestly. And it's kind of driving me nuts. I have a feeling I'm going to have to reset my entire phone to be able to clear out the Bluetooth settings and put in the right ones. I only have one set of hearing aids that's working properly. And uh, my ears are... Yeah, they're still a little clutched up, I'll say that. It's just not, not getting the progress that I want. I'd like more progress. I tried to make several videos and there have been some interruptions. Some of the videos were probably too sensitive, too detailed, fingered out specific people in the hierarchy far too much people that you don't even think about. People that I don't even think about. Uh, and that just might be too much right now, to be honest with you. And the state of the country right now after this, well, I think it was staged. I don't know what to make of this assassination attempt. I, I think it was, uh, I think it was all staged, to be honest with you. I just, I can't trust anything these days. So you can, you can chide me for being wrong on it. I don't know if I'm wrong or if I'm right on this. I have no idea. I just know we no longer have proper grounding underneath us. So we can't even really think for ourselves. We think that we think for ourselves, but we don't seem to realize that they control us through the language. They give us certain key terms, and they control the definitions, and they basically brainwash us from a distance. They make suggestions, and as a result of those suggestions, we think things out, and we come to a, a logical conclusion, which we figure, well, that's our own thinking. That's what I think. But that is to be questioned at this point. Why? Because they set it all up to begin with and control you from the distance. So you need to understand that not much of your own thinking can even be trusted at this point. And I hate to pull the rug out from you that far. And the, the easiest thing and best thing I can think of is to follow the examples. The examples, not just the letter of the law, but the examples in the Bible. Adam walked with his father in the cool of the day. Walked with God in the cool of the day. That's when we should be out walking, talking, doing a prayer walk. And we also know that the uh, this most recent version of the, uh, the Bible lets us know that that holy trinity that's lined up in other Bibles, that wasn't a proper translation. It was not right middle word should be the word and I know that's usually where people put Jesus the son but he was the word and we have to also remember that if we look at the Greek meaning of the word it means law logos and if we look at it very carefully and reduce it to the basic forms we realize it's referring to frequencies it's referring to the vibration it's referring to the energy which all of us are, all, all of this is. So it does refer to the building box of creation, the foundation of creation, the rain, down. I'm getting tired of her doing the drive-by licking stuff and getting all hopped up and walking back and forth. <clears throat> We're in Kearney, Nebraska. And I have to tell you, when I drove in here last evening, before the sunset, I was just amazed. I expected to see a bigger, more industrialized city. I didn't expect to see a place with such wide spaces, so well manicured, uh, almost gardens. Now, you won't call them gardens, but I will because, I mean, you go down and it's like the farming is so lush here. It's so intense and, I mean, it's like this is about the highest vibration in the country right now, right here in Kearney, Nebraska. I mean, it's beautiful. People are actually pretty nice to each other. <clears throat> I'm not seeing 
I'm not seeing any ghetto life. I'm seeing a society that's mixed up and homogenized pretty well, that are respectful and get along with each other really nicely. These people on the coast are crazy. They drive us crazy as well. The people in the heartland, the heart is good. It is good. Um, it's very beautiful here. The cars are clean. The streets are nice and wide. I mean, it's the grass seems to be greener here. I mean, the trees are green as well, but it's humid here and it's warm here. It's a little bit uncomfortable here. So, I mean, I ran the air conditioning all night. It shut off for a little bit, but you know, this morning it's it's on and it's working away. And uh, I've got her closed up. Basement's almost dried out. Uh, I've got one vent open in the center of the roof there to let the heat out. I did some cooking. Um, it's a nice area here. Lorraine, lay down. She got herself going again. I try to tell you my belief system from time to time, but it's in such play and in such flux that I don't like, I don't like trying to, I don't like trying to cast it, if you will. I don't like trying to chisel it in stone or cast it in concrete. I mean, it is flexible and fluid. And what I like about my current, I'll call it a synthesis, my current synthesis from my different brothers and sisters is that I like the preterists for their living in the present and their understanding that well, they say most of scripture has been fulfilled and, and I disagree with them but there's certain parts of scripture that have been fulfilled that we haven't recognized I think we may be in or in the transition to the time in which Yahweh takes out the heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh and then on top of that the law, his law, is etched upon our hearts. So nobody has to remember it. We all know it. It's like part of our hearts, part of our constitution. And we are not anywhere near the place where people will stop saying, no, Yahweh, because everyone will know Yahweh. But that is going to be happening. And I don't know how fast. I don't think there's that much time. I think things have to be accelerated from here forward. I think that some of you folks are going to be seeing some dramatic, wild stuff. I, myself, uh, I like being in the heartland, looking at what the way the country used to be. How people used to actually talk to one another, and they actually interacted. They, they took time. They weren't just short with each other and curt. You know, they didn't give pat answers like they were all programmed up. They had the right lines to say. You've got to remember, all of these years being subjected to these shows on television and these movies, you and I start to learn the lines. Not only that, we start to live by those lines. They program us up through that stuff. So, you know, I mean, I thought my grandparents were out of touch because they didn't keep up with the music. They didn't keep up with much of anything. But they were very much at peace, loved each other and their family, and they were very satisfied. And they weren't brainwashed and anxious and conjuring up evil thoughts in their mind. Not at all. Um, they were very level-headed level and experienced. And I talked with my grandfather a bit, and he was helpful as much as he could be. We men were not very talkative, and we certainly were, we were hug-phobic. That's all there was to it. Real men don't hug. And probably the, the nicest thing was my grandmother took time to sit with me and talk with me. And she explained what she learned in college. And I realized that she was college-educated back when most women weren't even graduating high school. 19, 1917, she graduated from Mount Holyoke College in, in 
Massachusetts. I think she was one of three sisters that graduated together. Their father, my older ancestor, really believed in education. He damn near worshipped it. And he made sure all of his children got educations. And he made a good living um, in the horse business. He was a horse breeder, a horse handler. And you need to understand that this is a trait of the Kents. It's not a trait of this Kent. I don't like the horse as much. They scare the heck out of me. I ain't getting the bone of those things. I mean, I don't mind talking to it. I don't mind petting it. I don't mind hanging around with it. But I don't know. There's something about getting up on the back of a horse that doesn't sit right with me. But the Kents were famous for breeding horses, famous for handling horses and taking good care of them. As a matter of fact, we had a horse handler on the Kent's estate. Now, the man wasn't literate. He couldn't write. He couldn't read. Um, but he was a, a very nice guy, and he was excellent with horses. It wasn't any better. He had a, an uncanny ability with the horses. And we called him William, sometimes Bill. And Bill was a, a simple guy. He didn't like wandering off the estate too much. He loved his horses. He loved to be with them all the doggone time. But once in a while, he would go down and to the pub. And uh, he actually got a bit of a reputation for himself. That's because suddenly he was a playwright. Suddenly, he was writing the richest plays ever known to mankind. And I want you to understand, that was programming. That was programming as well. And William Shakespeare had an advantage over the other playwrights. You see, he wasn't the real playwright. He was the front man. He was the guy they used used his name and his visage and all that to pretend. Why? Because the real playwright was the queen's son. And the queen's son by an illicit union. And had that union been discovered, they would have beheaded the queen. So the queen's very life was on, on the line. And her son was an uncanny sort. He was reared under a completely different name. As a matter of fact, he couldn't even be reared under his father's name. He had to be hidden. And he had a brother. I believe it was a younger brother. His younger brother had to be hidden as well, under a different name, reared by a different family. These were life or death situations because had the queen been discovered to have had sex outside of the bonds of holy matrimony, outside of the, uh, the requirements of the church, which was very powerful, the churches were extremely powerful, she could be sentenced to death, beheaded, and probably would have been. But what William Shakespeare's plays had going for him is that they told so much of the truth. They told the facts of what was going on in the Queen's Court. They told the inner secrets, the inner workings. They revealed a little too much. And people loved the plays. For another, the, the, the playwright knew enough to know that people like to be titillated. So he did take them to the edge or beyond in terms of taste and stimulation just like the movies do today. They always push the bounds one more limit. Did you, did you hear that? They used that word. They never used that word before on a television show. The devils desensitize us. The devils get us to turn our blacks on Yahweh and to violate Yahweh's laws violate his ordinances, his commandments, the things he says are going to stand forever. 
So they get us to alienate ourselves from our Creator Father God. It's pretty simple. They get us to do the sin. We do the crime. We get the time. And they love to sit back and watch that happen to us. There's nothing they like more than setting up one of us to lose our lives. It's one of their great sacrifices in their satanic church, by the way. You get an innocent man killed without getting your hands dirty. Doing that manipulation for some reason gives you a leg up on the, the ordinary murderer, mind you. So William Shakespeare was a horse handler on the Kent estate. And the playwright was the queen's son and the truth the real news was in the Shakespearean plays and he had that hands down over his competition and the number two playwright I think if I can remember his name Ben uh, Ben what was your last name I want to say Ben Carson but that's of course the physician Ben Johnson Ben Johnson was a number two playwright. And Ben Johnson was heard after the death of William Shakespeare to have bragged while getting a beer at the pub that he put a little arsenic in the old son's beer. So we have a murder, an unsolved murder of William Shakespeare. He was murdered, most likely at the hands of Ben Johnson. competition. The question is, did Ben Johnson do that of his own volition, or was he hired? Egged on. We don't know for sure, but I am going to bet that one of the Queen's knights, or perhaps the Queen herself, somebody high up in the court decided that this is had gone on too far, it was too risky, and they were on the verge of being discovered. And so they decided to retire the playwright, William Shakespeare. And they took his life, they killed him, they retired him permanently. And the real playwright went on, because you see, his uncle became king, and you would know him because of the famous Bible he's produced for you called the King James Bible. King James was not a good man. Matter of fact, Charles Dickens dedicated four pages on the forward of one of his books describing the evil character of King James. It was that bad that it went on for four pages. And believe me, nobody that's alive today held a candle. King James was, did back then. It was that bad. And he produced a Bible. And you're all going to wonder, what was the motivation? Why did King James produce the Bible? Well, we do know this, that the Queen's son, his nephew, oversaw the production of the King James Bible. Although his name is never associated with it. Not clearly and cleanly, but what we do know is the vocabulary that is in the King James Bible is magnificent. And the only other vocabulary that was as magnificent, those were the Shakespearean plays. There was a man, Sir Francis Bacon, and he became rather famous. And Sir Francis Bacon was the Queen's attorney. He represented the Queen. There was a fellow who challenged the Queen, tried to take the crown from her, and he was required to charge this man and try this man. And he got him convicted of his treason and got him executed. Unfortunately, well, maybe not unfortunately, 
We really don't know if Sir Francis Bacon was a good man or not. We don't. What we do know is that at age 12, he insisted upon a private audience with the Queen. And he got it. He had a private audience with the Queen of England. Unheard of. Went in there by himself and confronted her with the fact that he knew she was his mother. The queen blew up at him. She had a fit, just to put it mildly. And she banished him forever from the throne. He could never approach the throne again. And she also sent him to Spain. And she told him, you're going to Spain, you're going to become an attorney. He was that logical, that argumentative, had that much spirit, that she sent her son to become an attorney in Spain and get her, get him out of her sight. At least anything more happened to disrupt things. Queen Elizabeth died historically without having had a consort. That is not accurate. She had two boys by the same man. As best we can tell, that was a Mr. Kent. Which Mr. Kent, we do not know. But we do know that the Kents were given a land grant over here in the New World in 1649. And that would have been by King Charles I, who just reigned a few days, almost the full month of January. What we don't know is if Kents were awarded the land to get rid of them and get them out of the country because they were problems, or so that the king could establish, or the king was rewarding the Kents for good service, or paying us off, who knows, or the king was just merely es establishing his stronghold in the new world by sending over one of the strongest families. Now the Kents were the largest, well, I don't know for sure, but they were a very large county. The county of Kent was one of the bigger counties on the island. And we also brought you a loyal title, which basically meant that the king could never take the land back. He granted you a loyal title, that was it. He couldn't get the land back from you. All the other counties in England king could grab, grab the land back. He never gave it up fully to you. But in the county of Kent, we had a loyal title. And when the Kents came here to the New World, we also established what we called a loyal title, and we established what was called a patent office that would patent the land. So you would own it, just like in ancient Israel. It could not be attached. It could not be taxed away from you. It could not be taken from you. You own full rights in perpetuity. You own the surface rights, the subsurface, mineral rights, all of that, water rights, and all the rights above it as well. It was your little fiefdom. And that's what America was to be. That's how we started out. We had our own little plots of land that could not be removed from us. We were supposed to be a landed gentry, free men who owned land, and we had the law of the land. No, you do not have the law of the land anymore. Don't kid yourself. The attorneys rule you today. And the next highest profession, the attorneys rule you, they rob you, they, they do everything in the name of the British overlords. They do it for the King of England. England has never given us full independence. They've always ruled us from behind the scenes through their secret societies and intelligence organizations. And we should go after Great Britain for all the damage they've done to this nation and to the rest of the world. We should probably join with the Tricoms and go after Great Britain. I know, it's a novel idea and I'm giving it to you because I want you to get some flexibility in your thinking. Britain has been hell on wheels around the whole planet. 
I don't give a damn about that uppity accident or the other BS or their lies about golfing. Their lies, period. The King of Babylon sits upon the throne of Great Britain right now. Charles. Which Charles is he? The second, I think. I do want to warn you folks, but if you're going to go hide in your religion, and if you're going to use it like hopium, or opium, or drugs, then it's no good. Then you definitely have a religion of man. We read the Bible. We are Bible readers. We go by what's in the Bible, and the discovery of the truth is unending. We always are learning more, we're always discovering more. Things are not what they seem by a long shot. We are not free people. This is not a, a land of the, the brave at all. They've got us way screwed up. Have we had some brave men? Oh yeah, we've had some incredible men, some incredible privates some incredible generals. We've produced some of the best. We've actually had a few female warriors or something else too. Don't ask me to get in one of the planes with one of them though. I don't want them. I don't want them setting me just to show off that they can get me whatever. I'm thinking a killer chick in particular. I'm sure she can fly really well. She's done her service of the country, that's for sure. We have a problem. The deception is pretty much universal. None of us escapes the prevailing brainwashing. And right now they're running a man for president who's actually <laughs> somehow or other been declared being involved in the satanic church. Sorry. Ask Maria, Maria Abramovic. She'll tell you and tell you and keep telling you Trump is a magician at the highest level, which actually is the lowest level because they invert things, at the fifth level of their church, the satanic church. And he's going to unite the world. So what does that sound like to you? I know what it sounds like to me. I don't think I have to spit it out and say it right here. Not at all. It's not good. Is he going to be president? I have no doubts. I think they set that, that scene up yesterday to make sure he's going to be elected. Here's the problem. He is going to work for the bankers like he did before. Just like Joe Robinette Biden has been working for the bankers. That's right. And they're working for the royalty behind them that controls it, which are Roman senatorial families from ancient Rome they never went away so they are all behind the scenes ruling this place and what's our job as far as I'm concerned our job is to declare the kingdom of heaven upon the earth can we do it will we do it well I know one fool who declared that several years ago on YouTube I think they took that channel down. Who knows, that video might still be up after all these years. We are in a big quandary, a big fight. It is very perplexing. I'll do my best to tell you the truth as I understand it. But we have a couple of deadlines going on right now. And there are approximately six days of the Lord in the Bible. There isn't one six different days. That's the way I read it. You want to correct me on it? Please put it in the notes. Write a book about it. If you instruct me and correct me, believe me, I'll give you airtime for sure. But the year that we have to get to is the year 2046. That's 
one of the major days of the Lord, but I don't know just what. I have a book waiting for me in Colorado. It's an expensive book. I think I'm going to be disappointed in it, but I'm going to read it and analyze it and see if the gentleman's got things right. If he has things right, I'm going to applaud him and give him credit. If he hasn't got them right, if it's up for debate, I'll introduce the debate because I want somebody smarter than myself chiming in, helping out. We are living upon a world that is run by females. I know you don't believe that. You think it's a man's world and you think men are in charge. I don't think so. Not at all. I think this earth age started out with Eve and with that wife that Adam had before Eve. What was her name? Lilith. It didn't work out with her either. But here's the problem. Adam settled for Eve. And I don't know if it was such a good idea. Because you need to understand that Eve cucked Adam. Eve had sex with one of the six leaders of the fallen angels, Gadriel. And she gave birth to Cain. She became a deceiver and made a big announcement to Adam. Look, Adam. God's helped me get this son of yours. She cucked Adam. Now, I know that's pretty bad, and when they're going to run around and say, he blames us. Well, we don't have good data from back then. What we do know is the two had a union, and it produced Cain, which was a half-breed. And we know that, that after the law of kind after kind, there six times prior to that in the Bible, Yahweh created things just the way he wanted them. And he, he said it was all good. He loved it the way it was. He loved his creation the way he made it. And unfortunately, there was a spoiler, and that would be the, the fallen angel deciding he wanted to become part of God's family. And there's no better way to become part of God's family than to marry a God's daughter. So he seduced Eve. We don't know if it was outright knocked down, physical, rape. We just don't know. How close to death did she come in this whole thing? We have no idea. Then again, people say there was an apple involved. It's like, okay, was that a form of payment? Uh, it's said that it's the oldest profession in the world. So was it an act of prostitution? Or did Eve want to seduce God? Was she one of those earthlings who wanted to have sex with fallen angels? That's pretty prevalent in the Old Testament. They wanted to mate with these powerful ones so they could be powerful too. That's my guess. Now, this is an assumption. I need, to, I need to clarify that. That's an assumption. But we do know that the fallen angels saw the daughters of men, saw that they were fair, and they took all that they wanted for wives. We don't understand those relationships. Did they take them against their will? Did they take them without their family's uh, participation, which was the tradition? You know, the father gave his daughter in marriage. But we do know that in Genesis chapter 6, we have the first sin. The original sin. And I mean that in all ways and all levels. Couldn't possibly be right, could I? What we know is that the fallen angels were here, and we know that there were six leaders, and the name of the one who seduced Eve was Gadriel, which, of course, we would shorten the name and call him. Gad, we would use it like a nickname. Hey Gad, what's going on? And gradually, over time, according to Pastor Paul Burnham, this is where I got it from. Man passed away three years ago. He deserves his due. It became God. And 
that's how we got the name, gener the generic category, God, was from Gadriel. T-A-D-R-E-E-L, Gadriel, one of the six leaders of the fallen angels. And for some reason, the number 200 sticks in my mind that there were 200 fallen angels. That was one third of the heavenly host, which means another two thirds stayed in place, stayed loyal, remained faithful to their first estate, which means there's 400 of them left. Now, Pastor Jerry Wiki thinks that the angels continue to fall all the time. When they arrive here, they take on this form, this fleshly human form here, and they get to eat food, and they get to have sex, and apparently, this is my guess, the seminal fluids are more potent than any other of the species on Earth, because I have a feeling that they could have sex with any of the species which we would call man today and they would be able to produce offspring so I'm thinking they were very fecund they were super fertile and it was a powerful thing and I also believe that they were willing to engage in sex with pretty much anyone or anything and they created a lot of weird stuff on the planet that's taking it out there a little bit I have to admit but just trying to get you to be a little bit more flexible in your thinking Now, I happen to like the Praetorists in that they talk about living in the present. They're saying that we do not get eternal life, that Yahshua says he has eternal life. Okay, I haven't gotten very far in my reading and research on that. And it's a tough one. So, if he has eternal life, does that mean that we share in his eternal life or do we have a separate eternal life or do our children perhaps become extensions and become our eternal life provided they make it which is why I gave you the 2046 date because your goal is to get your children across the finish line into the next age that's right this age is ending we're going to have a new age beginning. And I think that our goal as men and women together should be to get our children across that finish line. I don't think there's much of anything that could be more important. Now, I also think that Yahshua came here for a real big purpose. And I know a lot of you think that it's salvation so we can sin and get away with it. No, man. I'm not buying into that. And uh, it does say that no longer will another man die for another man's sins, but everybody will basically die for their own. So, the book, the Old Testament, does indicate that we are going to be held to a just judgment. It has to be. If Yahweh is just and loving, he's got to fulfill his word and his promises. How he does that, well, of course, that is up to him. My thinking is that Yahshua came here to correct the original sin, to take care of that once and for all. Because we have these hybrids running around. And I don't really want to finger the blacks in particular, but it's an easy one to identify. It's an easy one to make these statements and to have, hold a little bit of water. But you need to understand that the whole world has become mixed at this point. And what we can tell is that Noah's flood, the purpose of it was to get rid of the mixes the violent ones because what we found according to another brother of mine who I don't really like his 
teaching methodology at all, and he's questionable. He says that we know that the offspring of a mixed relationship are okay. They're okay, nothing's wrong with them. They don't have a proclivity towards violence. But he says it's the grandchildren that have the proclivity towards violence. And he says by studying the book of Genesis very carefully, we come to discover that. Now, I have not discovered it, but I bring it up as a possibility. And I don't think that a man's fate is determined by his hierarchy and his family structure at all. I think a man can overcome things. Yahshua can pull his butt out of whatever it is he's in and bless it, correct him and shape him up and use him. That's what happened to me. It was a tough job for Yahweh. Well, it wasn't easy on me. So what I'm getting at is that we need to put an end to the fighting and the wars and the corruption on the earth and to the secret societies and to the ruling of the world from behind the scenes. People that worship the Satans. They worship all that evil, bad stuff and they're constantly making sacrifices to their gods. It doesn't matter whether or not their gods are real or not. What matters is this is what they believe. So I really do lean on the fact that we need to cultivate the Holy Spirit, that the way is our way. We only get to live this life once. We're only here one time, far as I can tell, when we get this short trip around the sun. However, we existed before the world was made. And right now, if you go back according to Big Bang Theory and to the Earth Ages, we've had a million Earth Ages here already. An Earth age is a little over 12,000 years. We've had a million of them already. Don't know if the figures are right. It kind of adds up that way. So we've had a lot of species on this planet. And we've had some de-evolution for sure. And we've had some evolution as well. But at this particular point, the Earth's children are weak. We are not. The earth is not producing the strongest children she's ever had. At the time of our founders, our founding nation, they were much stronger than we are today. They didn't have anywhere near the poisons and the compounds and the chemicals to deal with that we deal with today. Their thinking was much clearer. They were far more intelligent than we were and better educated. They had better understanding. And if you don't believe me and you think, well, we have doctors today. Go back and read the writings of the founders, and you tell me if you understand that, okay? Then tell me, if you understand it, could you write something as concise? Could you write with that level of, of clarity, sincerity, I mean, and candidness, and, and wisdom? No, you could not. I can't do it. There are moments I have little breakthroughs, little spurts, and I do something that looks pretty good, but of course I'll go back and look at it and best judgment out of myself and it won't be so hot. What do I want you to do? I want you to read your Bibles. I want you to cultivate the Holy Spirit. I want you to press into the way it is your way. And I know this is going to sound like the Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. But the fact is that Yahweh wants a relationship with each of us. And don't worry about if there's room enough for you at all. Don't worry about it. Uh, the capacity for parallel processing is just, it's unfathomable. I mean, it really is unfathomable. And I had a fellow that I met that told me his story the hole in heaven as he called it and he explained it to me and it was a powerful witness you have capabilities as well when under proper guidance just incredible this fellow was up in heaven he had gone over his life 
life history with two angels. They went over the whole thing and they were three of them were in agreement that he was it was more towards good than towards bad. He had done much more good than he had done bad. And the two angels are telling him, You have to go back. And this guy's like, No man, I'm I'm cool, I'm fine, I'm I'm happy where I am. This is I wanna go back. And he said, yeah, You don't understand. You have to go back. And so they told him, you see this hole here in the floor? Put your head over the hole. And he could see the earth down below the hole. And when he put his head over that hole, all at one time, his mind was flooded with each individual voice that was praying for him, including his wife and his children, his friends, people he hadn't thought about in a long time, were praying for him. And he still had a daughter yet to be born, so he really had to go back. He went back, age 35, broken up body, life as a rodeo clown right on the edge one of those guys that egged the bulls on and took the hits sometimes ended up in the hospital so you're capable of all that parallel processing so don't think that Yahweh isn't, <laughs> hasn't got the capacity because he certainly does he gave it to you and I We have to stop this warring and the worship of these hybrids, this miscegenation. Yahweh loves his creation the way he made it. He loves it. He wants it that way. But we have become co-creators and we have miscegenated and we've created different stable phenotypes. We've created new species, so in a certain real sense, we've become co-creators with Creator Father God Yahweh. I don't think we want to rival Him. I don't think we really want to be co-creators with Him. We want to work with Him. And above all, remember this. When you get the call for your mission, when the Spirit works on you and summons you and tells you, go talk to that person over you got to be able to determine, is this the spirit? Just one of my own ideas, what's that? So you have to learn to develop that. And you have to trust it so you can get the blessings when you actually follow the spirit and go over and do what, it's, what this spirit told you to do. And usually it's different than anything you think. It's a lot different than what you expected. That's kind of the boat I was in 10 years ago. I ignored the spirit, didn't do so well. Other times I went forward thinking it's the spirit and it's like my own ego, my own imagination. It's not easy, but I will tell you this. When you get the calling, when he calls, it's not a party line. You're not gonna be called up with other people, most likely. I'm sure you could be. But anyway, what I'm getting at is he maps out, you may choose your path, he marks out your steps. He's going to decide what you've got to go through to do the best for the next part on the way, his way, his will, what he's plotted out for you. Okay. So I'm going to sign off. I think we've covered quite a bit. I don't know what to call this. I can't believe it's already the 15th of July, but it is. I've been on the road a little bit, trying to take care of things with friends, and just busy with chores, trying to take care of things here. May Yahweh bless.